want to commend you. I want to applaud you. I want to celebrate the fact that you've been studying the book of Daniel and you've nearly completed a read through and a study of this wonderful, powerful book. It's not an easy book to understand, but it is a book that can change your life. Because of travel plans, I'm recording this message in advance, but I want you to know that on the day you study this passage and on the day we ponder Daniel 11, I'm going to dedicate some special time of prayer that God will open your heart to receive the powerful story that is found in this wonderful chapter. Let's pray together and then we'll get to work. Heavenly Father, we pray that today you would speak to our hearts and that our hearts would be open to you. Please forgive our speaker. You know his sins are so many. And help us to see Jesus, just Jesus. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Daniel chapter 11 is not famous for its inspirational words. You won't find it listed along with the 23rd Psalm and the Lord's Prayer as famous passages of poetry. You'll never go to Hobby Lobby and see a framed calligraphy of the first verse of Daniel chapter 11 that reads, Now then I tell you the truth, three more kings will appear in Persia and then a fourth who will be far richer than the others. And when he has gained power by his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. <laughs> This chapter struggles to make a good first impression. And that's why many people skip it when they study the book of Daniel. Yet we are not among those. Because we're going to find out that Daniel chapter 11 can be a gold mine of treasure for the careful student. Now when I say careful student, I mean the student who's willing to study this chapter with an open Bible in one hand and an open history book in the other. Because Daniel chapter 11 is a chapter of prophecies made and prophecies fulfilled. And as we begin to see the prophecies fulfilled, we find our own faith strengthened. The reading is tedious for sure, but it serves an essential role in Daniel's story. It reinforces the theme of Daniel's book. And that theme is simply this, There is a God in heaven. In chapter 1, we saw God as the God of the faithful, as he protected young Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego. In chapter 2, he was the God of the ages in the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. In chapter 3, he was the God of the fiery furnace as he delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Chapter 4 related his ability to humble the proud like Nebuchadnezzar. Belshazzar, according to chapter 5, disregarded his holiness at a high price. According to chapter 6, there is a God in heaven who can shut the mouth of a lion and protect the saint like Daniel. Chapter 7 described the evil nations, but the Ancient of Days will defeat them. Chapter 8 revealed the Antichrist, but his days are shortened. Why? Because there is a God in heaven. The stunning prophecy of chapter 9 dismissed any notion of an absentee creator. There is a God in heaven. And according to chapter 10, this God in heaven sends angels to hear our prayers and to minister to his saints. And today, according to Daniel chapter 11, there is a God in heaven who directs history. And he is working the way of history toward his desired outcome. God prophesies the future, and God fulfills the prophecy. Case in point, the fourth and final vision given to Daniel. It is found here in Daniel chapter 11, and it forecasted the events of three and a half centuries beginning around 500 B.C. Now, it might interest you to know that Daniel chapter 11 has been a battleground for scholars over the last couple of hundred years. History responds so precisely with the prophecy of verses 1 through 35 that the pagan philosopher Porphyry denounced the book of Daniel as a forgery in the 3rd century AD. He claimed that it must have been written during the time of the prophecy, not prior to it. Of course, he offered no explanation for the precise prophecy 
of Daniel 9 in which the arrival of Jesus in Jerusalem is dated 483 years in advance. And except for Porphyry, no one questioned its traditional 6th century date for 2,000 years. There are other reasons believed that this book was written in the days of Daniel and by Daniel himself. It was confirmed by reference in the book of Ezekiel three times the name Daniel is mentioned. And most importantly, Jesus Christ himself quoted the prophecy of Daniel in his famous Olivet Discourse. Now, there will always be skeptics who attempt to dismiss prophecy, and yet there will always be seekers who seek to learn from prophecy. Let's be among the latter. Let's begin now with the prophecy of Daniel chapter 11. It advances, first of all, the reliability of Scripture. The reliability of Scripture. Allow me, if you will, to toggle back and forth between your Bible and your history book, and you'll see what I mean. Your Bible prophesied in Daniel 11, 2, three more kings shall arise in Persia. And your history book says they did just that. Cambyses, Pseudosmyrtus, and Darius I. Your Bible explained in verse 2, a fourth shall be far richer than all of them, and he shall stir up all against the kingdom of Greece. History confirmed this prophecy. His name, Xerxes I. Your Bible prophesied, a mighty king shall arise. Your history book proves the prophecy correct and gives us his name. You'll recognize it, Alexander the Great. And your Bible gives us these details about Alexander the Great's life. His kingdom shall be broken and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not to his posterity, nor according to the authority with which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up and go to others beside these. Well, your history book says this is correct. It affirms this prophecy. And it gives us the name of the four rulers, Chalcedon, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. Now, pause and observe. We've only read three verses and already seen the fulfillment of nine different prophecies. And this vision is just getting started. Daniel is then told about the kings of the south and the north. The Bible says, the king of the south, south shall be strong. He was. His name was Ptolemy Souter. And then the Bible says, but one of his princes shall be stronger. He was. <laughs> his name was Seleucus the first Nicator. And he overtook Babylon and, and other areas. And then the Bible says, the daughter of the king of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. This happened as well. Ptolemy the second sent his daughter Bernice to marry Antiochus II, the Theos, and form an alliance. We could keep this up for a long time. The prophecy of chapter 11 goes on to include a conspiracy to murder, the nation of Egypt, a defeat in battle, the invasion of a nation, another marriage that led to a peace treaty. What Daniel saw in the vision, we read in our history books. From my count... The vision of Daniel foresaw at least 25 major historical events over a 350-year period. Now, let's bring this into perspective. Let's imagine something similar happening with our history. Most of us are far more familiar with the events of the 1700s and the 1800s than we are with the events of 500, 400, and 300 B.C. So let's just imagine. Let's imagine that a book is discovered that was written in the 14th century, several years before the Mayflower, the Pilgrims, and the Revolutionary War. And let's suppose that this book spoke of a small boat crossing a large ocean, a conflict between natives and newcomers, a covenant between 13 districts, the rise of mechanical tools for agriculture, and a boat that could cross the land on rails? Do you suppose this book would garner any attention? Do you suppose any historian would be interested in studying more about this book? And let's suppose that the book went on. Let's say it went on to prophesy about a great war between the north and the south the assassination of a leader, another war which involved the entire world, 
A great financial collapse that left millions destitute and dying. Any historian worth his or her salt would read that book and say, who wrote this? And how did they know? This document foresaw the future. It described events before they happened. It announced in detail the rise and fall struggles and successes of our society. And every academic on the planet would want to know the source of the discovered document. And suppose it went on to give us more. A man walking on the moon, a pocket-sized box that carried messages and voices. The emergence of a violent group from the old, old lands across the sea. Now, someone alert to the sequence of events would map out a timeline and they would announce, here is where we are. We are right here. And because all of these things happened in the past, whatever this book says about the future, (laughs) we should perk up and pay attention. Should we not do the same? Over and over, the book of Daniel says, this will happen and then it happened. This will happen and then it happened. And those who pay attention point to the timeline and say, here is where we are. Here is where we are. We have a reliable source to tell us what is going to happen next. By some estimates, your Bible contains over 300 fulfilled prophecies about the life of Jesus alone. There are well over 500 prophecies that have been fulfilled over a variety of topics, but 300 just about the life of Jesus, 29 of which were fulfilled on the day of his crucifixion. What are the odds? What are the odds of something like that happening? Well, that was the question that a mathematician by the name of Peter Stoner tackled. He was struck by the number of prophecies that were fulfilled in that short period of time that we call the crucifixion of Christ. Prophecies like these. The betrayal by a familiar friend, Psalm 41 and verse 9. The forsaking of the disciples, though being offended at him, Psalm 31 and verse 11. The false accusation, Psalm 35 and verse 11. The silence before the judges, Isaiah 53 and verse 7. Being proven guiltless, Isaiah 53 and verse 9. Being included with sinners, Isaiah 53 and verse 12. Being crucified, Psalm 22, 16. The mockery of the spectators, Psalm 109 and verse 25. Again, we could go on and on and on. 29 specific prophecies that had to do with the life of Jesus himself. Did you know that in his death, 29 of these were fulfilled precisely? What are the mathematical possibilities of all of these prophecies being fulfilled in the life of one man during one season of time? The answer, one over 840, I don't know how to read that number. I do know it has 97 zeros. That's amazing. Stoner goes on to estimate the odds of just eight prophecies being fulfilled in the life of one man in one lifetime this way. He says, consider the state of Texas two feet deep in silver dollars. On one dollar, place one mark. What are the odds that a person could, on the first attempt, select the marked dollar? These are the same odds that eight prophecies would be satisfied in the life of one man. Yet, at least 29 were fulfilled in Jesus' life in just one day. Now, why? Why do we and why does the Bible make such a big deal about prophecies and the fulfillment of prophecies? Here's the answer. To lay one more plank in the bridge of faith over which a doubter can walk. Prophecies lay one more plank in the bridge of faith over which the doubter can walk. We all doubt sometimes. We all struggle to believe. 
We all wonder if what the Bible says is true. Fulfilled prophecy is yet one more manner in which God beckons the seeking heart to himself and says, you can trust in me. And don't we need someone in whom to trust? In difficult times and challenging days, don't we need someone in whom to trust? The reason for prophecy is clear. To prompt us to perk up and to place our faith in God and to find our place on the timeline of God. God has explained the end from the beginning. Isaiah 6, 46 and verse 10. He does nothing except through his servants. That's the promise of Amos 3, 7. What he has said he will do, he has done. So we can conclude what he promises to do, he will do. So the reliability of scriptures reinforces this second point, And that is the dependability of God. Again, this is one of the reasons for Daniel chapter 11. Acknowledging it is difficult to study sometimes. At first blush, it's hard to follow. It doesn't have the poetry of the 23rd Psalm or the lilt of the Lord's Prayer. But don't dismiss it. This chapter and other chapters will put a force in your faith and conviction in your confidence. There is a God in heaven and he is the God of of history. And when he points to the future, we should pay attention, which is what he did with the last section of the chapter. He gave Daniel a vision of someone by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. The down and dirty on Antiochus Epiphanes is that he was down and dirty. The prophecy said he will be succeeded by a contemptible person who has not been given the honor of royalty. He will invade the kingdom when its people feel secure. He will seize it through intrigue. Now, following the death of Seleucus IV, Antiochus seized the throne and gave himself the name Antiochus Epiphanes, which means glorious. In verses 21 through 35, offer yet another list of prophecies that were precisely fulfilled in the bloodthirsty reign of this evil monarch. According to verse 22, all the armies would be swept away. Antiochus did this by deposing the Jewish high priest. Verses 23 and 24 speak of an unprecedented alliance that will result in a victory based on deceit. If this sounds familiar to what the Antichrist is going to do, that prophecy is purposeful. This is a Two-fold picture of what Antiochus Epiphanes did and what the Antichrist is going to do in the Great Tribulation. Antiochus curried favor with wealth and ultimately defeated the Egyptians. He returned to the temple and look, he, his heart shall be set against the Holy Covenant. That's exactly what happened. Antiochus Epiphanes went on to profane the temple. He slaughtered the Jews. He turned the temple into a worship center for Zeus and thousands were killed before the Maccabean revolt in which the temple was recaptured and purified. This all fulfilled prophecies like verse 29. He shall take action against the holy covenant. He shall profane the temple. The people who know their God will stand firm. Daniel was writing this centuries before it happened. Prophecy after prophecy. Fulfillment after fulfillment, passage after passage, scripture after scripture, the wise take note. The wise take heart. God has earned our attention and he has given us a book that will lead us into the future by telling us about the future before the future happens. But in these days of Babylon, few choose to read this book. And in these days of Babylon, many mock this book. And in these days of Babylon, they ignore the promises of God and they dismiss the prophecies of God. And you know what? They, they mock you for taking them seriously. The Apostle Peter said this. I want you to think about the words the holy prophets spoke in the past. That's what we've been doing, thinking about the words the holy prophets spoke in the past. And remember the command of our Lord and Savior that he gave us through your apostles. It is most important for you to understand 
what will happen in the last days. Peter says, in order to understand what will happen in the last days, study the words of the prophets in the past. God wants you to be prepared for the last days. He does not want you, he does not want me to be unaware. He wants us to be prepared and to trust him. We've seen some remarkable prophecies in the book of Daniel. We've looked at some pretty remarkable promises about the future over the last few weeks. And you may have read these or heard these and thought to yourself, now is God really going to do that? Is Jesus really going to come and rapture the church before a great tribulation? Will God really permit the Antichrist to wreak havoc havoc upon this planet? Will there really come a time that Jesus will descend from heaven in the company of his church? And will Jesus once and for all destroy Satan in a great decisive and final battle? Dare we believe this? Scripture says, look how God has kept his word in the past and let that give you courage to know he will keep his word in the future. Chapters like Daniel 11 are designed to give the careful student faith. What God has said he will do, he will do. Isaiah 42 and verse 9 records the words of God. God says, I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place. And the new things I declare before they spring into being, I announce them to you. God says, see, look at my track record. See, read my resume. See, see what I have done. Can we trust his word? Consider the prophecies. Can we trust his promises? God has promised to give you a new body that will never die, diminish, or succumb to disease. Dare we trust that promise? God has promised to wash away your sins. Dare we trust that promise? God has promised to never leave you or forsake you. Dare we trust that promise? We'll consider the prophecies. God says, remember the former things. Those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning. From ancient times what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand. And I will do all that I please. Dear friend. You can trust the promises of God. You can trust the promises of God. No one understands everything about the future. But we can understand this, that our God is a faithful God. And if he says he will do something, he will do it. The story is told about a man who ordered an expensive barometer. He lived on Long Island, New York in the days long before weather apps and TV forecasts. He thought it would be prudent to be able to anticipate the storms that would roll in off the Atlantic Ocean. So he ordered an expensive barometer out of a mail-order catalog. When he unpacked the instrument, he was dismayed to see that the needle was stuck, pointing to the word hurricane. No matter how hard he shook it, he could not budge the needle. So he wrote a letter to the manufacturer And he took it to the post office in Manhattan the next day when he went into Manhattan to go to work. As he was leaving later that afternoon to return home, a severe squall blew in. It was so severe he had to spend the night in Manhattan. He was delayed by a full day. And by the time he reached his island, the barometer was missing. And so was his house. There had been a hurricane. God's word is like a barometer. Scoff at it if you want. Mock it if you desire. Dismiss it if you choose. But I dare say you're doing so at high risk. I would encourage you to be wise 
read it and heed it because God's word forecasts a wonderful day, but it also forecasts a major storm. And it is arriving sooner than you might imagine. Let's pray together. And now, Heavenly Father, we ask you to help our hearts be open to whatever message it is that you would like us to receive out of your teaching. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would use these messages from Daniel chapter 11, these prophecies, to strengthen our own faith. Use them to call a doubter or a cynic away from the cliff of disbelief. Use these words to strengthen our faith in your word, to believe that what you have said you will do, you will do. Through Jesus we pray. And all the church. 